the opportunity to talk in this uh, occasion. Uh, it's been a pleasure to you know speak in particular in front of uh, TVR um, and and uh, on on this you know 70th birthday uh, uh, felicitation. Um, and th that's essentially the reason I thought I'll talk about something which um, has to do with localization. Uh, what's interesting about localization is it's continuously evolving itself in spite of you know years of um, study, experiments, theory. And recently what has happened is Graphene has presented us with a new uh, dimensionality to it. I mean, there has been, uh, over the last four years, there's been absolute craze in Graphene. And uh, both from fundamental as well as um, you know, application uh, devices. But the new dimension of localization that Graphene presents uh, has been quite interesting. And particularly in terms of weak localization correction. And what we are going to talk about today uh, is something which is a cousin of weak localization, which universal conductance fluctuations, and show how the band structure of graphene provides us a new uh, characteristics um, which to universal conductance fluctuations, which in some form is not so universal because you can change it by externally tuning various parameters. Uh, this work has been done uh, primarily by the final year graduate student, Atin, and, uh, hang on, let me just see which is the right direction. <coughs> yeah, it's not working. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> just be careful, don't ask bad questions. Um, what I'm going to do here is, um, I'm going to, just for the, initiation purposes, um, tell you what the universal conductance fluctuation is. This is all known for a very long time. What happens is, if you have got a system, which is of length L, and lots of disorder in it, and you pass electrons from one side to the other, the electron starts moving here diffusively by getting scattered in various parts. We all know that. If you apply a magnetic field or change the Fermi energy of the electrons, or even change the disorder configuration, the conductance of this particular system starts fluctuating in an aperiodic but reproducible manner. What has been shown that this fluctuations, when you me measure it within a phase coherent volume, which is length being less than L5, then this magnitude of conductance fluctuations is very close to E square over H, or in the order of E square over H, which is independent of the material properties, the device geometries, um, and uh, you know uh, the details of the system, and that's why it's called universal. And this universal conductance fluctuations is essentially an effect of quantum interference of electrons uh, in this in this metal, because what happens is that these backscattering of electrons essentially superpose on each other, leading to a standing wave pattern, which is extremely sensitive to any change of these parameters like EF, the Fermi energy, magnetic field, and disorder. So that's the regular metal. Here, that's what we know. Problem is, what does graphene say that changes this? It turns out graphene has valleys. And what I'm going to show you in this talk, uh, how valleys can modify this concept of universal conductance fluctuations in a, in a metal. Um, to some extent, the reason behind this talk is not just about graphene, but also about these new materials. In, in fact, topological insulators as well which has got Dirac-like uh, dispersion, and not two, but one valley. So uh, a lot of, lot of the studies that we are doing in this context can be relevant to other fields emerging ones as well. Uh, just a quick uh, recapitulation for people who are not very uh, connected to graphene. Uh, it's a honeycomb lattice. And hence, you can actually construct the full lattice using two sub-lattices, the blue ones and the red ones. When that happens, then the Hamiltonian looks uh, somewhat like this, where sigma, which is called the pseudospin, corresponds to A and B sublattices. Okay, because of that, the wave function of electrons can be constructed using uh, by a spinner, where psi A and psi B come from two different sublattices, which are, to start with, degenerate. Um, now, if you can take a tight binding model or any other for that matter, and then solve the band structure, it turns out that the 
band structure of graphene has got two values at two equivalent points, K prime and K. Each of these branches come from two sublattices, the red one uh, and blue one are two sublattices, but they form a cone with the, uh, at the, these two points, K and K prime, leading to the fact that actually there is a value degeneracy. This, these are the two values, K and K prime. This leads to a four component wave function. The two coming from sublattices and two coming from the valleys, leading to a, a wave function which is four different components. And this is why the interesting part of graphene comes and all its phenomenology that we see are product of that. Just to go through. Yeah, spin, the, the real spin I'm not considering at all. And I'm probably not considering at all most of the time. Okay. Uh, so it's all either pseudospin, that is, which comes from uh, valley, uh, sublattices, and valley isospin. Okay. Now, it turns out that because of this uh, sublattices, you now have very space in it, and that leads to a whole game of uh, half integer quantum Hall effect, which we all know uh, leads, led to the Nobel Prize and all sorts of things. Anyway, uh, this is where the interesting component, I don't know whether you can see from the this extra half comes from the Berry's phase in graphene, and um, which is essentially the reason of uh, this weird quantum Hall effect. Also, what people have observed is the absence of backscattering. If you are in one particular valley, then the elect you can actually show, because of the Berry's phase, the probability uh, of backscattering is suppressed. And that leads to weak anti-localization. Uh, this is also has been observed. Um, you can see and at higher temperature, the graphene resistivity essentially increases with increase in magnetic field rather than negative magnetic resistance. This is something which we will go in much more detail in our talk today. Um, Klein tunneling is another uh, phenomenon which has been now claimed uh, in, by some of the groups. But there are many, many um, phenomena which are still to be observed, particularly those connected to values. One of the very interesting effects that has been recently, actually this year, reported in science from Mangosolov and the Gain group, is the Valley Hall effect. Valley Hall effect is analogous to quantum Hall effect, but with valleys replacing the spin. Um, also, because of the valleys, you have non-universality. Uh, universality class are quite weird in graphene. M universality of mesoscopic fluctuations are unknown. So there's a large class of problems that are open and still not understood, which are connected to the presence of valleys in, in, in graphene. Um, a related problem, graphene, it's not really well known whether the time reversal symmetry is, is uh, a well-defined uh, um, state. For example, you know, because of the curvature of graphene when you put it on a surface, there's a huge pseudo-magnetic field which can actually break the time reversal symmetry. So people are not very sure yet whether uh, the time reversal symmetry is in graphene is maintained. In fact, there was a paper in quantum dot of graphene which showed that probably time reversal symmetry is spontaneously broken in graphene, which will be interesting because then the, the two Dirac cones will be, uh, which are coupled through time reversal symmetry will get affected. And probably one could get a topological insulated type dispersion in graphene if you could actually spontaneously break time reversal symmetry. But these are various suggestions, and we would like to see with our talk today how many of them we can address using uh, noise uh, uh, measurements. Question, yeah. Values are known in semiconductors. Of course, of course. What's new uh, to some extent, Dirac. Um, yeah. I mean, it might be very useful for the graphene system to show what's different. Yeah, rather yeah. Than Absolutely. So I'm going to, that's exactly the purpose of the talk. I'm going to show you what's different about graphene than other ones. Uh, so first question, quickly. Why would you look, look at um, values in graphene? Um, there are now very uh, several uh, suggestions that you can actually use uh, values instead of spins uh, to uh, lead to an electronics uh, based on values, which you call valetronics. You can create valley current rather than spin current. Um, and this has been both theoretically and some very recent experiments are also showing it. 
a value Hall effect is something which I have told you, and value-based quantum computation, which is actually an interesting uh, proposal, proposal as well. What you can do is that you can create double quantum dots and take value singlets and value triplets as your qubit. Um, so there are very interesting um, suggestions with to do values. Um, apart from that, as I said, there's a very interesting uh, change, and this is probably where, uh, uh, you know, Ravi, I come to your question. You can actually go to different symmetries of the Hamiltonian, which you, when you have value degeneracy and we do not have value degeneracy, one of the, for example, if you have a value symmetry in which the value k and k prime have the same energy, then uh, you have a symplectic universality class, which is like a spin orbit interact, a material with spin orbit interaction, like, it's not exactly because they're topologically different. Um, we can have a completely different universality class if you actually make electrons jump from here to here and hybridize the two values. If you do that, then the degeneracy of the values are removed, and that then starts behaving like a normal metal. In case of graphene, you can do it very easily than most other materials. So for example, silicon also has values, but it's very difficult to actually take one and put it on the other uh, value as easily as I will show you that you can do in graphene. So that's the experimental advantage in graphene that you have over other materials, okay? So there's a very interesting uh, symmetry properties that can be tuned by values, um, which led to, quickly, the last, really, the introduction slide, a very interesting quantum correction to conductivity. This is where uh, the values started affecting how the quantum correction or weak localization correction in graphene will behave. Let me quickly spend a little time on this. Um, you know, in case of graphene, in the sublattice space, because of the two valleys, you can have, in terms of the cuperons, you can have three possible cuperons, the singlet and the triplets, okay? So there are four different possible combinations which depend on the kind of scattering you have. The scattering, which is long-range momentum relaxation, is always going to be there. Apart from that, there are two other scattering mechanisms, the intra-valley and inter-valley scattering mechanisms, in which an electron is transferred from one valley to the other. This is done by the short-range potential fluctuations, because particularly defects, which are uh, atomically sharp, so that any scattering from that will change the k by a large number and change the value from k to k prime. When you have that, this one, then you actually hybridize the two values and the inter-value scattering can remove the degeneracy. Because of this reason, the total quantum correction to conductivity in graphene has got four different terms, Cx, Cy, and Cz, which depend on the combinations of different scattering, particularly intra and inter-value scattering. And depending on the which one survives, your localization correction, weak localization correction is either positive or negative. We know that in case of a standard real metal, CX, CY, CZ don't exist because there's no triplets. So only co component is minus C0, which comes from this momentum relaxation, and hence you get negative magnetic resistance only. In case of graphene, that's not the case. This is uh, a typical data which came out in 2009. So these are actually fairly recent if you think about it. Um, let me quickly explain this. So this is a PIL which came out from Sevchenko group in uh, Exeter. Uh, this is at 14 Kelvin data looking at graphene at different densities. Why different densities? I'll come to that in a, in a few minutes. You'll see that when the short range scattering dominates, which removes a value degeneracy, Cx, Cy, Cz are, are, are all zero, you get standard negative magnetic resistance correction. As you increase magnetic field, conductivity increases, gives you the standard negative magnetic resistance. Whereas, if your short term scattering is removed from the system, that means the values are not hybridized, the, they are degenerate, then Cx, Cy, Cz will all contribute and you will now have a positive mental resistance, which is like this, giving rise to a system which is having anti-localization like a standard spin orbit material. So this is the advantage you have with graphene, that you can actually go from one kind of quantum transport to another one by simply varying certain experimental parameters. Is this 
Absolutely. And that's what I'm going to show how to get control. Density can give you a change from one, from, you know, team the valley degeneracy in the system. That's right. Um, question that we ask here, we have already seen how weak localization behavior works. How does universal conductance fluctuations change as a function of valley degeneracy and the valley, you know, hybridization? That's the topic of our talk today. Question, in order to do the experiments, we have to have two answers of how to tune the valley degeneracy in graphene using external means. Number one. Number two, how to do the noise and what, what kind of fluctuations you'd see in graphene and whether that actually arises from interference effects. So these are the two questions and I'm then going to couple them and to show you how noise is affected by valleys. Okay, but this is a typical experiment, so I'll now tell you what kind of devices we make. Um, most uh, graphene-based devices are made on uh, insulating substrate, which has got a large metal underneath, uh, which acts as a gate. So if you see, this is a silicon-silicon oxide wafer. There's a thick silicon oxide, like about 300 nanometer oxide. Below that, there would be a heavily doped silicon, which uh, is metallic, so you can apply a voltage on that to make a gate. So you put graphene on top and then put some electrical contacts and then you apply a gate voltage back on this. Okay. If you put a positive gate voltage, then you induce electrons in graphene. If you apply a negative gate voltage, you induce holes in it. Because of this, you, in both sides, the resistance eventually comes down. So this is a bell-shaped curve, which is a generic feature of a graphene field effect device. Um, what a typical, since I'm an experimentalist, I have to show actual device. And this is a device which, for example, it looks like this is a graphene on a silicon silicon oxide wafer. And these are um, gold contact pads. Uh, you can see this is an electron uh, microscopic picture. Um, the typical graphene sizes you get now is in the order of few microns. So they are naturally mesoscopic in nature. It's th of course, these days you can get big samples as well. But exfoliated graphene, which you get by scotch tape peeling, are generically uh, microscopic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually very happy that you actually noticed it. Very nice. OK. Uh, you know what happens is that you never get that peak at zero. Because uh, when you actually create this graphene, you dope the graphene immediately. I mean, the, there will be a transfer of charge between um, oxide and, and the graphene, which actually shifts the charge neutrality point slightly. Using the gate voltage, you essentially change the carrier density. Okay. And, and you know, the, the importance of this question will come, uh, become imminent very soon, because these charge, transfer charge, actually is the major source of momentum relaxation. They get trapped in the substrate, apply a Coulomb potential back on graphene, and the electrons in graphene get scattered by them. Ah, <laughs> no. Uh, thank you. Uh, toothbrush would be nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. That's going to be a wrong business. <laughs> okay. So now, um, this tells us what kind of disorder, because we would like to actually remove the valley degeneracy, and we show that the short range scattering removes the valley degeneracy, whereas long range scattering does not. So we would like to know what kind of disorder that you have in graphene. First of all is the atomic scale defects. Of course, the grain boundaries, there would be, there would be uh, vacancies, and they, these atomic scale defe defects are, of course, short term scattering, and they can transfer electrons from one value to the other. The major one, it looks like, in graphene, for most practical purposes, is dominated by charged impurity, exactly what Mohit said. What happens is, whenever you make graphene, there are a large number of trapped states right at the interface between graphene and the silicon oxide. When you have that, these guys apply a Coulomb potential. This is the three or four different sources from which this charge uh, traps are, uh, the trap charges come. The interfaces because of the oxide surface is imperfect. There are also lots of uh, ions which can drift from the uh, doped silicon back to the interface and gives rise to Coulomb potential. Um, what happens is this because of this um, charge traps. What uh, the, m the main source of scattering becomes the Coulomb potential created by those charge, and that has got two uh, immediate experimental signature, which we always check. For example, the linear variation of conductivity with carrier density. This has been done uh, significantly and um, very elaborately in the Merlin group. They showed that when you vary the carrier density, if the 
primary source of scattering is the coulomb potential from the trap charges, then the conductivity must vary linearly with density. That's number one. In, and that is the result of, of um, you know, linear band structure and the screening properties of graphene. That's number one. Number two is the puddles. The puddles of uh, charge, particularly at low density. Uh, when, you, when you make the density sufficiently low, you break the charge um, layout in electron and hole puddles. So these two have been taken and shown analytically, theoretically and experimentally to be a result of trap charges at the interface. Okay? What we did actually is shown that the low frequency noise in graphene is also a, a, a product of, of these trap charges. And it's extremely important to know that you know, this is the major source of interaction. Let me quickly tell you what happens to low frequency noise in graphene. You, you know, uh, if you take graphene uh, in which resistance versus density looks like this, what you can do instead of doing anything, just sit here. You sit here and uh, look at the conductance as a function of time. Okay? You will see that when you are at the charge neutral region, where the zero gate voltage, uh, your conductance fluctuations are much larger than when you are at the metallic region, where here or here, the conductance fluctuations are very, very small. So if you take the variance of conductance, it looks something like this. It peaks at the direct point and goes down on either side of, here yeah. Yeah, no, this particular sample just, this particular sample just accidentally had okay. at zero. Yeah. So this is something which we don't have any control on. God-given sample. It's a God-given sample, you can say that. Okay. So this is, uh, w what we then s found that the reason behind this is the charge impurity scattering. Quickly tell you how it happens. Uh, graphene here, the trap charges here, so those trap charges start in, in, you know, give you a Coulomb interaction. Oops. Ah, the pointer has. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so the trap charges is put Coulomb potential back on, and this rise gives rise to a fluctuating Coulomb potential. What happens is electron jump in to the traps, goes back to the trap, uh, to graphene, and this fluctuating Coulomb potential gives rise to the low frequency noise in graphene. So we actually did some work on this uh, for quite some time, and uh, we showed that <coughs> there are two ways the trap charges can affect. One is by simply taking in and out, and other, in the substrate itself, the trap charge can move from one trap to the other. And that gives rise to another component of low frequency noise, given the full thing, uh, something like this. So this is typically how the noise behaves in graphene um, at higher temperatures, remember. And as a function of density, we could model everything uh, using the fact that the disorder is dominated by the trap charges. Uh, then, this is, the one of the reasons I spend so much of time is uh, the dominance of trap charge is a boon to us. Let me tell you why. Um, if you want to s look at the valley effect on conductance fluctuations, what you need to s see, you need to go from long range potential fluctuations to short range potential fluctuations. At lower densities, the trap charges are screened much less than at higher densities of graphene. So by simply changing the gate voltage, and that's the question you have, by simply changing the gate voltage, when the gate voltage is low, the screening of potentials Coulomb potential is low, and the disorder is primarily Coulombic in nature and long range in nature. Whereas, at when the disorder density is high, these Coulomb charges in the substrate are screened very well, and the only disorder are the short range potential fluctuations left in it, and that break the value degeneracy. Let me tell you how this happens. Okay, so this is this density dependence of low temperature transport. Well, this is a typical resistivity versus gate voltage. Nice. Uh, resistivity increases at, at roughly zero gate bias. You convert that to conductivity, sigma versus gate voltage, and you'll see that over here, this region and this region are linear density region, like this, and which is means that this region is dominated by charged impurity scattering, expected because load density is sufficiently low, so there is no screening of the Coulomb potential. So once you have that, if you do weak localization measurements on this at three different densities, for example, uh, at low density, another one in the linear region, 
and then at high density. Look at the difference, and this is something which gives us the handle. When we are here, then there is strong Coulomb potential fluctuation because the density of graphene is low, which means that long range Coulomb potential fluctuates means that the negative magnetic resistance component is far lower. When you are here, because the Coulomb potential of the substrate charges have been screened off by graphene, the major potential fluctuation is the short range in nature and look at the huge negative magnetic resistance correction to the quantum conductance, quantum correction. So which means that in this region, the potential is long range and in the higher range, potential is strong short range which means by simply varying the density of graphene, we can change the value degeneracy by changing the nature of disorder or potential fluctuations. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So over here, it's a strong interval scattering. Over here, there is no interval scattering. Okay. Yeah. So the of uh, of conductance. Yeah, that doesn't change much. That's is, is the shape of the curve changes. So this is another example of how graphene is different from standard material, where you actually can have a full handle of the valley uh, component. Okay. Um, now the question we come to the come to the question of this work. Uh, how does UCF universal conductance fluctuations uh, vary in graphene? Uh, Vikram, how much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> uh, we don't have a good chairman, uh, you know. Yeah, he's he's over <laughs> top I know, uh, clearly. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll show you the measurement of noise in two ways. Okay. Uh, let me quickly tell you how conductance fluctuation in graphene looks like. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So this is a uh, this is a resistance versus temperature, uh, resistance versus gate voltage at density. What we do in the first way, if you want to look at how conductance fluctuates as a function of Fermi energy, you see this is a region. For example, we have chosen converted resistance to conductance, and then look at uh, look at how the conductance changes at different temperatures. At higher temperature, it's fairly smooth as a function of gate voltage. It's a small window that we take. Okay, as just a just small region, and then we start decreasing the temperature, and when we go down to few millikelvin, you see a large fluctuations in this, and these fluctuations are, of course, if you look at the scale, in the order of e square by h, about 0.5 to 1 in that order of magnitude. But this is a telltale sign that these are weak localization correction or, 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 or universal conductance fluctuations coming because Fermi energy is changing in a disorder potential. Okay, so this is first uh, first um, evidence of universal conductance fluctuations. However, if you are from graphene community, and if I show this graph, most people actually will start objecting because graphene also has got charge particles which can lead to fluctuation in conductivity. So I really have to prove without a doubt that these are universal conductance fluctuations and not some uh, stray charging events. So what, in order to do so, we actually did another experiment, which I will quickly tell you. Instead of varying the gate voltage, what we did is that we stayed again and varied the time. As you can see, what we have done before, looked at graphene uh, as a f uh, resistance as a function of time without changing the gate voltage. Uh, this leads to fluctuations, and if you take the fluctuation uh, variance, the variance behaves like this. And what universal conductance fluctuation says, that if you have got a disorder potential, which is fluctuating, even that would lead to fluctuation in the conductivity or uh, resistance. Um, so if the using the ergodic hypothesis, really, so that essentially it means the ensembles, different ensembles are being realized at different times. Um, to prove that for sure, you do what you call a magneto noise. Okay? So you, you apply a small, tiny, tiny magnetic field and see how the fluctuation behaves. And this is one of the, uh, you know, generic way of checking whether your noise comes from universal conductance fluctuations, in which you apply a magnetic field of a few milliteslas, and noise comes down exactly by a factor of two. Okay. Essentially, the, the two contributions, diffusions and couperons, the couperon channel essentially gets wiped out by a magnetic field because you are destroying the time reversal invariance. The diffusion component stays back, leading to exact half reduction in noise. Um, so this is something which is very close, kin, kin, kin to, kin to uh, weak localization. As you can see, both of them happen roughly at the same field scale. 
So uh, I'll tell you in a minute why this factor of two comes, but this is taken as a, as a, um, you know, a smoking gun proof of universal conductance fluctuations. Um, as you can see in case of graphene, if you do at various densities, these factor of two reduction in magneto noise is there everywhere. So it means that any noise that we see as a function of time or as a function of gate voltage actually arise from interference effect or universal conductance fluctuations. Are they, they are perfectly reproducible. Yeah. Th that was a question that people have asked. Using this, you're absolutely right, using this we prove that in mesoscopic sample time reversal symmetry in graphene is perfectly intact. Okay, so that's very important conclusion. So that's one of the questions we started off from. So this is the first answer to that question. Uh, okay, so as you increase the temperature, as you can see, uh, when the uh, when the uh, when the phase breaking length becomes smaller than the elastic scattering length, uh, the weak localization, the UCF correction is gone. So there is nothing left at high temperatures. Only pure quantum effect at low temperatures. Um, this is the answer to the question why uh, this factor of two dependence comes. It, this has been observed in bismuth films and, and silver films in the, for the last 20 years. Uh, we are, when the time reversal symmetry is there at zero magnetic field, your system is either in a symplectic or in an orthogonal class. And then if you apply a magnetic field, it goes to a unitaris class where the window Dyson parameter one goes to two and, and that reduces the noise exactly by a factor of two. So because in UCF, the noise magnitude is inversely proportional to the Wigner Dyson parameter, which goes from one to two in, uh, when you apply a magnetic field. So that that's shows the noise we get is from uh, UCF. The last bit, what happens as to UCF noise magnitude when it vary the density, and that is change the, the, change the value degeneracy. OK. So this is the conductance versus gate voltage. What we do here, at, every, at each and every point, we measure now the noise magnitude. As you can see, the noise magnitude is huge at the direct point, comes down, comes down on both sides. That's what we see everywhere. But this is what is measured. What we need to know in, in order to compare with the theory is what is the noise in one phase coherent volume? UCF magnitude is given by, is, is e squared by h in one phase coherent volume, in factor of four. We actually can prove it to you by, you know, superposing the conductance versus gate voltage. You can see the linear component is here. So this is where noise is high. This is where sublinear region noise is low. Still it's universal, it's coefficient change. Coefficient changes, yes. But you can change it by doing simply gate voltage sweeps, which is why I call it non-universal. OK. Um, this, is, uh, this is one. And this is another device, which is it's a very device independent effect in which you can see that low density, where the value degree is there, noise is large. Low, high density, noise is low. Not just low, but exactly factor of four low. And why uh, this is possible? You know the. UCF is essentially the number of gapless uh, diffusion and cupolon channels. Now what happens when you remove the valley degeneracy, which is here, you just get contribution from one singlet channel. When you have valley degeneracy, you have got singlet and the three triplet channels, which means that there is going to be exactly a factor of four change in the universal conductance fluctuation magnitude. And that's also, you know, uh, there are many implications as the universality class changes and so on and so forth. Uh, this is uh, a temperature dependence. We show that it's a per per perfectly robust effect in which this is 10 millikelvin, this is 300 millikelvin. At 4.5 kelvin, it, the measurement becomes very difficult, so I just kept it for your reference. But you can clearly see that as a function of temperature, this change in the conductance fluctuations is factor of 4 irrespective of temperature. Um, well, that's about it, really. Um, what we have seen is possibly one of the ways of reading valley coherent state in graphene using noise, which can actually act as a physical resource if you want to do applications, if you want to do reading of qubits, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's where this particular work is very exciting. Um, summary, electron transport in graphene is extremely sensitive to local charge environment. Um, it's a noisy conductor. And it looks like that at low temperature, the noise does arise from universal conductance fluctuations. Um, it's a 
question that we ask. The time reversal symmetry is, is perfectly maintained irrespective of the fact that the graphene has got ripples. It may have got uh, moments around its edges, but it looks like they don't matter. As far as the transport is concerned, noise says that time reversal symmetry in graphene is maintained. And also, we probably using UCF, it becomes a very interesting probe to uh, the valley coherent state in graphene. Uh, this is my acknowledgement, uh, our collaborators and funding. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. yeah, these are, what you demonstrated is we can do really nice things with graphene, but in principle, the same stuff could be done in antimony dope germanium, for example, by putting stress. Yeah. You can go from four valleys to one valley. Yeah. Uh, and a very nice work by Fritchie and collaborators okay. in the 60s. It's just that nobody did, <laughs> did anything like that. In, uh, yeah, nobody did contest in fact. It's, it's something that, you know, there are lots of nice could things. You, could you get it? We need to, we need to you can't get it, it. it but, but what you do is you use stress to go from one where. Okay, okay. Uh, and and the stress simple. that is needed is very small, it's few kilobars. Okay, okay. And you can change the, change the values for, uh, to from one to four. Okay. I end up with you. Have you studied conductance fluctuation with magnetic field? Because it's spin yes. with it. And how does it change? Uh, I, I showed you. Oh, sorry. I, the in all the uh, This is the high temperature. Uh, can we talk about low temperature but separately? Uh, separately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this is the only the high, high temperature. Yeah. High temperature, clearly, there's no problem in time reversal symmetry. If you go back to your magnetic resistance, lots. It seems like there's some kind of a W shape, I think. Uh, you mean the magnetic resistance, resistance one? Yeah. Oh, I got it. What do you mean? Yeah, this one? Yeah, there seems to be some kind of a change in the sign of the. Over here? Is that just a, uh, yeah. This one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, actually it's not changing sign. You see, what happens is that at uh, these temperatures, this is taken at 4.4 Kelvin. Um, the weak localization correction, the negative magnetic resistance correction comes initially, and then the weak anti-localization correction takes over. Okay. So the larger field scale is anti-localization, whereas uh, here is a uh, weak localization. So this is why graphene is quite different. We, the problem correction in graphene is quite different from standard metal. You can actually tune from this negative part to, actually if you go to a slightly higher temperature, you will not see this part at all. You will only come, only, uh, you know, we can't localization. Um, when you plot your uh, variance, uh, you are normalizing it, right? You had one graph with the temperature dependence of the variance. Could you go back to that? Yeah, that one, that one, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I, I can quickly explain. Why, why should it be, t I mean, it's a quantum effect. Why should right, it right, be right, right. You're absolutely right. You see, um, in ca there are two ways we do the experiment. One is simply looking at the uh, sweeping of, of gate voltage. And if you look at that, then there's no problem. This is where, the, as you change the gate voltage, you can see this fluctuation magnitude increases with decreasing temperature, which is supposed to be the case in a, in a quantum, quantum effect. Fine. This is one of the ways. In the way I've shown next is actually through time dependence. What happens here is you, you fix your gate voltage. You don't change that. But you look at the conductance as a function of time. Now, why should the conductance fluctuate as a function of time? It's because your, dense, your disorder in the system is continuously fluctuating and you're giving one ensemble to the other. Why that happens is because of the trap charges. You see, trap charges go on jumping from one trap to the other, giving rise to a change, continuously changing disorder landscape on graphene. Now, what time is sorry? What is the time? Oh, the time of this effect is in seconds. It's in, in, it's in seconds. It's a, it's a long time effect. in a given uh, number of uh, electrons and, and so on, in yeah. configuration, and et cetera. Yeah. That's good. That's right. So it's at, at a particular instant, the number of electrons are constant, and you have a particular disorder. It changed slightly the, because the disorder is changing, your resistance is changing. Now, to quickly answer the question why the conductance fluctuation is decreasing, is as you go down in temperature, the electrons jumping from one trap to the other getting smaller and smaller in number. That means the, 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 it is normalized by sigma square. It is normalized. 
the reason it is decreasing with temperature is because the, the disorder change is becoming slower and slower. Most of the disorder, are like the number of mobile disorder, if, the, if that's the right way, number of mobile disorder is decreasing with decreasing temperature. So that's why this, is, this has got a different temperature dependence uh, than the previous one. But both of them eventually arise from the same quantum effect, the yeah. interference. Arendam, but does yeah. that mean that if you wait for an hour, your point will go up? No, 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 no. This is variance already normalized. Uh, how long ever you wait for this, it doesn't matter. Because the temperature, the, at a particular temperature, noise is determined by how many mobile disorders you have. By waiting a long time, you are not changing the number of mobile disorders. So that yeah. remains fixed. Down there. Oh. Okay. Yeah, this one? Uh, no, before that. There is this del yeah, this one. Uh, so for the green curve, yeah, there seems to be some asymmetry towards the high end of the magnetic fields. Um, yes, as, uh, you're right. I mean, this asymmetry is something which there are two possibilities to my understanding. You see, most mesoscopic samples, because of the regular shape, uh, the magnetic resistance can actually get, get asymmetric from the positive and ne negative magnetic field. It has sometimes in asymmetry is attributed to existence of local moments, but that is not the case here. Uh, so that's f one of the reasons. And another reason is possibly there is some intrinsic particle asymmetry in graphene because of the contacts. But I think the first one is more likely. It's an asymmetric uh, f structure of this graphene because it's mesoscopic in nature. We don't have any control on the structure shape. It's, it's asymmetric. Okay. Uh, th just one more question about this curve. So solid black line which has been plotted. Solid black line. Yeah. Is that a guide to the eye? No, or no, no, these are fixed. These are fixed. So like this fit takes care of the fact that it is asymmetric and magnetic. No, you, uh, we fit it for two sides independently. Oh, two sides independently. Okay. Yeah. Not one particular function. No. Okay. No. Is it true? 